is the Mindset Athlete Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. I'm a two-time Paralympian and owner of James Robert Fitness, which is an online training, nutrition, and mindset coaching business. First of all, I'd like to thank Lauren Williams for suggesting this quote to the show. An athlete is a mindset. It's how you prepare, think, and execute. Not because of some elite status or physical stature. Anybody can be an athlete. By Chris Hart. And each week on the Mindset Athlete, we like to bring you inspirational athletes, a message, or experts talking about human optimization to teach you how to change your perception of your mindset and become 1% better. And on today's show, I've got John Cofino. John is a basketball coach, scout, and athletic mentor who has coached at every level, including head coach of the Albuquerque Thunderbirds in the NBA Development League. You see that Wikipedia is not updated. The G League. Uh, coach Gofino has also coached overseas for the last 10 years in several countries, including Spain, China, Kenya, Qatar, the Republic of Georgia, United Kingdom, the Republic of the Maldives, and Denmark, and most recently was the head coach of IMG Academy. So welcome on to the show, John. James, good to see you again. Oh, it's my Thank pleasure. You. Oh, it's great to have you back on. And obviously, John and I uh, did an episode way back when on episode 141. So if you haven't seen that one, do check that out. So, John, obviously, if we go right into the gist of it, you've coached at every level imaginable in basketball. And this is going to be a difficult question straight off the bat. Which was the most fulfilling and brought you the most joy? I would say working in Kenya, um, you know, for $70 a week. um, It was most fulfilling and most heart heart wrenching. You know, um, I actually got the job through my good friend, Robbie Pierce from from the, from the United Kingdom, you know, because uh, um, he, he, we Skyped and they were looking for a coach that's going to really put his foot down on these players. And he said, there's a lot of talent, but they, they need guidance. And, and I said, you know what, I'm, I'd like to come out there and, 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 you know, it was a challenge for me and I had to learn how to coach all over again because really you're starting from scratch and I had to, I had to be a little tough on the guys in the beginning, but after a couple of weeks they got in line and they started seeing results and uh, it was an, a major challenge being an out, outsider, especially in that country where uh, there's very limited um, non-Africans, as, uh, you know, I was Caucasian and, and it, 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 but it didn't bother me. I just, it was just something I had to adjust to. And, um, they were very, very nice to me. And, um, but it, it, it was my most fulfilling James, as you, as you ask, I, I, even though I, I wasn't getting paid really, basically, uh, I want, I went to, uh, try to supplement my salary by taking a, a coaching job, two coaching jobs, excuse me, in, um, at the International School of Kenya, and I got the girls and boys high school jobs, and uh, and and that's when they the terrorist attack on the on the Westgate Mall hit, and I lost my 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 uh, it, it, within a week of coaching them, I lost a girl uh, and her mother, and it was really a, a a very 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 somber sad day for me and and my girls, and it was another challenge that I had to overcome and, and, and try to keep the kids together, but they were hurting badly. And, and it, it was, it was crazy, crazy times. You know, uh, I realized that I have to, I have to watch, watch out for myself. My family wanted me to come home, but there was no way I was coming home. No way I was leaving my, my, my academy guys and, and, and my high school kids. Do you think on that basis then from your, your, your time as a scout, the African content is still an under, under tapped, and it's in terms of you got the rawest form of athlete that you said. Do you think that's still a, an untapped continent in terms of the game of basketball? Well, I mean, it's no secret anymore. Obviously, there's quite a few Africans in, in, in not only in the NBA but in, in, in the universities here in the states, and now they're coming into high schools. You know, and I mean, um, uh, they they uh, they want an education, which is you know very very important. They want an education and they have talent 
they, and, and I think that it's, it's been very difficult to, and nowadays with all that's going on in the world, it's been even increased difficulty of getting visas, student visas and coming over, but um, it can be done. It's just, you have to be lucky and, and um, you have to have the right people backing you up, but it's, it's, it's tough, you know, and immigration is a, is a major issue here in the United States. And, um, but I, I wanted to help the kids. I mean, these, these kids actually wanted an education. They wanted to go to school. They wanted to get a degree and learn a trade and, and go back home and, and, and take care of their, their family and friends. So Africa is, uh, Booming, booming. And, and it's not just booming, but there are countries still that are untapped as far as talent goes. But the, 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 the main ones are obviously South Sudan and, and Nigeria and, you know, and, and, and Mali and, um, um, you know, the Congo and there's so, so many of Cameroon. But there's some countries out there that haven't really been really explored for basketball. Um, Uganda's, I think I, I see Uganda as being one. That's going to turn up uh, a lot of players in, in the future. Out of interest, that's curiosity that you you mentioned Uganda. Why specifically that country? I think because of the, the um, their location. Uh, for, for, for one, um, they're right next to Kenya. You know, Ethiopia, South Sudan. So, and it's a country that's welcoming a lot of these, you know, other um, c- countries I- I- into their school system. So I think um, the talent level is going to get higher um, and the competition is going to get better. And, and I just think that, you know, um, I know, I know um, the guy, Dan, Dan, you know, Robbie Pierce's son, Dan, Daniel, he, he's, he's, he's putting together a beautiful academy there. Um, that's, that's, you know, a year or two away, but it's, it's going to be, it's going to be state of the art. And, and I think it's going to be a big time place for kids to, to uh, start their careers. So that moves me nicely to my next question for you then, John. In terms of, obviously, I read on your Instagram uh, post that you shared uh, from Huggy Bear. Why do you think the current generation are missing out by not playing on what he called, quote unquote, the, the black top by not playing their old, older peers? Yeah, I mean, you know, my generation, uh, you know, Bob Huggins, he's, he's, a, he's the coach of West Virginia. University and, uh, and he's a tough, tough love kind of guy, but he, he's old school like me. And, you know, I grew up in the Bronx playing on the blacktop, playing on the asphalt, you know, the concrete, which is why my feet are, are shot right now. You know, I can't even step out. When I step out of bed, I can't even put my feet down. It's, it, it, it takes a toll on you. But those were the days when people just flocked to the schoolyards, you know, and, they, and they'd line up on the fences to play next. And if you lost, you had a long wait. And, you know, if you won, you stayed on the court and, uh, we had, we also had, you know, these centers that we'd go to at night to play and we just nonstop. But nowadays kids have so many other things going on, you know, so many other distractions, you know, including video games and, and computers and, and, and stuff like that. But that's what I, I think he, what he means is a lot of guys aren't, aren't, don't have that passion. They want to be good. They want to play in the NBA, but they don't want to wake up in the morning, uh, and, and shoot around in the schoolyard and then, and then, go home when, when the sun goes down and the lights are on the court. And, you know, my mother used to come looking for me and I used to get in trouble all the time. And I played to all crazy hours in the morning and, and then she stopped looking for me. She knew I was in the schoolyard, you know, and, and things were good back then. Yeah. It's, it's a shame. You know, I, I wish that we had more schoolyards in, 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 in not just New York, New York has so many, you know, uh, places. And there's a place called West Fourth street where, People just go to watch the games. It's just like a little shoebox, you know. It's a, it's, it's, it, but people play there all the time, and and that's that's the old school and playing on the blacktop and using the backboards because the backboards were metal and and you had to hit hit the ball a certain way for it to to go in. No nets and stuff like that. Sometimes we had the chain nets, but after a guy lost his finger, got caught on it with his ring, everybody stopped using some chain nets. But yeah, the old days, are, you know, I mean, he's he's old school, and you know, those guys don't usually change. And he's a player's coach like myself and, you know, but, uh, he does adjust a little bit and, and, but he, he, he misses those old, old times when people just run out to the school and play, you know, you didn't have to ask. Do you think coming back to the earlier point that we, you said Africa was an untapped region, do you think that's the kind of mindset they have? They're going to use the sport 
to not just better their life and their family, which is the same for probably African Americans and people in the United States trying to get out of the quote unquote ghetto. But do you think they are not necessarily fixated on the destination of the NBA? They're going to use the basketball to get their education. If the basketball doesn't work out, I've still got a job. I've got a career. I think, you know, having traveled around the world and, and talked to the kids, they all have dreams of the NBA. They all have dreams of playing in college. Uh, now with the internet, you know, and, and, and the cable TV and everything, people, the kids get to see a lot of basketball from America, which is our, our number one sport. And, you know, we, we, uh, we, we, we do have a lot of talent here. There's no question about it. Uh, but I, I think the kids have dreams and you never want to get in the way of their dreams uh, and, and tell them that they can't. Um, but they do want that experience and having been around the world and seeing the situations that a lot of these kids are in, you really do appreciate where you're from, especially in, in the United States where we really do have it so much better than a lot of people. And, uh, you, a lot of people don't know that here. You know, they take it for granted. But when you go out in the world, and we, we were in Kenya and the slums, and, you know, I, I was in China and, and Georgia and a lot of places where they just didn't have, A, the facilities, or, or B, the equipment, and, and, you know, or even coaches, you know, that, 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 that wanted to, you know, develop players. It's, 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 they're smart. People are smart around the world. They want to go where the, where the action is. They want to go where they can get better. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't convince others to, to, to leave their situation. Some people will just never will leave, and, and that's okay. I mean, that's their choice. But you know, you have to you have to go and and, and get the right coaching and, and go to the right places where you you you're going to get the most out of it. And I think that, that that's what they want. They want that experience. They want to they want to live that. And, and you, you can't fault them, you know, and I wanted to experience, you know, the overseas cultures you know, and in, in, in the Middle East and in, in, in Europe and in Asia. I, I, I was everywhere, but Australia, I was never in Australia, but, but I was everywhere. And, and I got to see that and, and I'm, I'm glad I did. And, and, and now I can compare. Um, there's no place like the United States. I'm not saying it's better. It's just, there's no place like it. And, and we, we really do take things for granted. But that that willingness to explore, do you think that comes back to your your mindset that you mentioned in the Never Followed Trends podcast? Of it's it's not black or white. You 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 you're not gonna um, oh, what's the word I want to use? Um, discriminate on a person for their race, their religion, their creed, their gender. Do you think that's your you've got an openness from the very very beginnings of your youth? Then you know. Maybe it's the way I was brought up, my parents, my family. Uh, but I did grow up in a schoolyard of, of you know, racist people. You know, we, we, we were a white group of guys that would go in and have gang fights with other ethnic groups. And um, as I said in our other podcast, we, we used to play basketball in our schoolyard. We had eight courts. By, the Parks Department put up eight baskets. And when the African-Americans and, and other foreigners came to, the, you know, to play, my, my racist friends tore down the rims and, and just left me one and put it up every time I wanted to play. And I was so upset because I really enjoyed playing with other players, especially the better ones. Um, but I didn't see that, you know, even though I was affiliated with this, this gang, you know, and this group, A, I never was uh, unable to walk through neighborhoods like – I could walk through a, 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 a black neighborhood or a Spanish neighborhood or, and no one would bother me because they'd say, Hey, that guy's cool. Don't, don't hit him. Don't do nothing, you know, and everything. And, uh, but I, I just didn't see color. I didn't, yes, I, I, I knew they were different, but what it's just, you know, like basketball, like most sports, even, you know, football in your, your country, it's a universal sport, you know? So who, who cares? Who cares who plays, who coaches, who referees, who cares? It's the sport that matters, you know? Me, like I said in the other podcast, my first, when I played in college, I was the only white kid on the team. I was the only white kid. And I got along with everybody. I had no choice, but I, I, I would have gotten along anyway, and it was a great experience for me. 
it was a great, they accepted me. Um, and I learned a lot about them, their cultures, you know, their upbringings. Um, I learned how they, they eat certain foods, you know, when we went down south in the Southern parts of the United States where there's certain Southern style cooking and how they ate certain things with butter, with sugar. And it was really interesting, you know, and I, I would have never, I would have never uh, knew that unless I played basketball. And I, so I'm very, very fortunate. I was fortunate to, to be part of a, a, not only to grow up in New York city, but to be part of a, of a melting pot where, you know, there's so many different cultures and I just don't understand how we cannot coexist and, and what, you know, and, and it, and it comes from our parents. I think it comes from the parents who teach their kids, you know, what's right and wrong and, and education is part of it. Right. When you were at university, would that be like the 1970s then? No, <laughs> I'm not that old, James. <laughs> no, and I was, I went to actually, well, I mean, no, I, I finished high school in 1980. Okay, my apologies. I, I didn't go to college for a, a long time, 10 years. And then I decided I want to get out of the streets. I needed education. And I went to, I started going to this community college. And they said, why don't you try out for the team? I said, ah, I'm not going to make this team. Look at these guys. And every day I would try my best. I'd run out the gym and and I would vomit in the, in the garbage can and I stopped eating lunch during the days that we had tryouts and, and the assistant coach says, Hey, he wants to give you a uniform, man. You got to keep pushing through. I know it's hard. And they put me up against the fastest guys. They, they make me guard the best players. And, and I got in great shape. It was the best shape of my life. And I made the team, you know, and I don't know. I, I guess, uh, you know, it was the early nineties. But the seventies were, were were the racial racial tension, a lot of racial tension, a lot of a lot of racial riots and not, not riots, uh, wars and fights and gangs and neighborhoods and you know it, it went. It, it I was in, I was in the middle of all of that, and but I was protected. I was very very lucky, very lucky. But obviously, you mentioned that that you didn't think you were good enough in the nineties. Talk to me about that mindset because I'm surprised to hear you say that. Well, I mean. I hadn't played organized basketball, so I didn't, you know, I wasn't recruited by this coach. And turns out he's like one of the all time best coaches in the country. And, 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 and he's in five Hall of Fames and, you know, and ha- has a thousand wins under his belt. And I was like, my friend said, you, you're playing for him. I go, yeah, I, I didn't know who he was. I mean, and he, he really took a liking to me. My, I, he's actually from the, he turns out that his family, my family are from, from the same neighborhoods growing up. And so, he says, yeah, ask your father about this guy and that guy and all that. And it was really cool. And then to this day, he's my, he's my mentor. To this day, he follows my career. And I'll never forget the time when he offered me the job. And he said, you know, I'm going to see you on TV someday, coaching in Madison Square Garden. And I'm going to see you in the NBA. I know it. I just know it. And he was right. Did you, did it, do you think it took that belief? from somebody else into you to, to you to revision that for yourself? Yeah. I mean, I never thought about coaching, you know, um, I love basketball since, since I was a child, five, six years old, I always had a basketball with me. Um, but I don't know why, you know, I just, I just loved it. And then I started following certain players, but coaching was not, uh, something that really even was a thought. And then one day when he offered me the job and I went home and I told my family and my sister, my older sister, Diane said, your ship has come in. This is, this is it. I could see it in your eyes. I could see the passion. I could see that you, you've been bit by this coaching bug, your, your, your excitement. And my first year I, I did all the recruiting and we went, we won our region and um, missed going to the nationals by one game and, and the, and the rest is history. I, I was, uh, I really started enjoying it and, and I learned from the best. I was just lucky. I walked into that gym, into that guy's office and had no idea who he was. And the basketball guards were sending me there for sure. They, they, the path that they gave me was, was not always smooth, but where they started me, I, I'm the luckiest guy. Anybody that coached under that guy or played under him, 
you know, realizes how lucky they were and how fortunate we were to, to, to have access to his knowledge. He was amazing. And is that something you like to obviously pass on to the next generation? Obviously the players being willing to be a sponge from you. Yeah, you know, that's 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 the name of that's the game, man. You know, you you your basketball's giving you so much, you should give twice as much back. Um yeah, it's it's funny you say that. I just got an email from a former player of mine from Niagara University who wants to get into coaching. And he says, how do I, how do I get my license? How do I get a job? You know, what do I do? And, you know, we sat down and we, 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 I told him what to do to get his coaching license. I told him that he has to network, come work with me at some camps, you know, and I get a lot of those things. Uh, a lot of guys want to coach, and, you know, uh, I, when they say, when I, when they say they want to coach, I said, uh, you should consider going to dental school instead, you know, <laughs> but because it, it's a stress stressful job, but it's a good stress most of the time. The stress is is, is really good. It's worth it, and uh, you know the, you're going to have your ups and downs, and you're going to make some great relationships. And, and and there really is, you know, a lot to teach. And and still, I'm I'm continuing to learn myself. And but you're right, I do get enjoyment out of helping others and helping the younger groups that want to get into coaching. It's not for everybody. <clears throat> A lot of guys don't want to pay their dues. Like like our, the old timers, we, we paid our dues, you know. I mean, I coached in junior college, and I was an a, administrative assistant, and I was, you know, I moved up the ladder. And I paid my dues as an assistant for 14, 15 years. And then I finally got a head coaching job, and, you know, I've always been a head coach. I have no problem being an assistant either, but I just that's the way it's been since, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, uh, but, you know, I uh, – 13 years ago. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a lot of guys want to coach, but there's very few jobs, right? There's more, there's more, there's more jobs for players because there's more, you know, obviously 12, 15 on a team, but only one coach and a couple, maybe one or two assistants. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a very competitive um, profession. You have to really work hard. You have to develop an identity and, 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 and show people that you're willing to, you know, um, put in the time. It's like I said, it's not for everybody. If you're married with a family, sometimes that's tough. It's tough on the family because you're not coming home in the right hours and, and they, they miss you and they want you, your presence. And a lot of guys have given up the job because of that, because of their family, you know, they had to choose. And most, most, most guys chose to, to be, you know, to get, to get a nine to five job and, and come home in, at a reasonable hour. But again, me being single, single was, was also a um, a plus because I could I could work fifteen sixteen hours a day and hustle and and make a name for myself which is what I did you know subconsciously. And do do you think that the stresses that you mentioned, John, people don't always see it because ultimately they they, they see what the hustle and grind of the players from a playing perspective and as social media has evolved and I, this is something I kind of pushed the Cheshire Phoenix to do a little bit more of and try and copy lesser riders in terms of there's your benchmark for social media. They try and exceed that. And I think because people want to know as much as possible about the player, be it from the UK perspective for people that don't know, it's more, there's more overturn of players. So that's the not be it if we use, the NBA as the long-term contract, the the playing staff is going to change from year to year. So I think it enables them to get to know the the player more as a person. But obviously, you being the coach there as well, it was more a family. I mean, yeah. I mean, expect, you know, overseas usually it's uh, it's one year unless you know you you really like it there and they like you and and they want to extend your 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 contract and it's hard for the fans to, to get in an attachment to these players because it's, they just, they're, they're here for maybe six to eight months and, and that's it. Um, but you're right. Uh, it's, it's, it is a family type thing. It's, it's relationships that will, will be with you forever. And, and, you know, every team is different every year. Something's different about the team and very rare that do, do teams have the same, literally, you know, one through 12 have the same rosters, you know, but one of the reasons why Leicester and Newcastle 
have always been so good is because of their consistency of, the, of their personnel. And, um, but it's, t- it's difficult because guys are always moving on. And, um, but I, I, you know, I, um, I, I get attached to my players. I've had some run-ins with players. I mean, if you coach long enough, you're going to have problems and you learn how to deal with them. Um, you know, by making mistakes and I've made, I made, you know, my share of mistakes, uh, on how I handle things and, uh, regrets, but that's part of growing, you know, part of, part of being a strong coach and you learn, you learn uh, about the big picture and hopefully down the road, your, your, your relationships continue even after the, their careers are over and they see things that you were trying to teach them that they're teaching to their kids. And, and they realize that, you know, you, you were trying to send a message and, and, you know, you were out looking for their own good, not, not trying to hurt them. And obviously, John, you your last job most recently was working at IMG, and most people would have heard of IMG Academy, be it maybe less so for the basketball, but for maybe the football program worldwide, and obviously their their dealings with the NFL and the, uh, international program. Why the change from working overseas to coming to work back stateside and working? I would put it as like a prep school, but obviously it's slightly elevated from that. Right. So I'm in Georgia and my season's over and I get a call from an agent and they say, we have a a national job that's available and I want to put your name up for it. I said, that's my dream. I've never coached a national team. I don't care if it's in Siberia. And the agent says, well, you're in luck. It's in the Maldives. I go, what? You mean the, the Maldives with, you know, the beautiful place? He said, yeah, yeah, it's not a great team. You know, they're a hundred percent Muslim country. And, um, so you have to, you know, be aware of that. And uh, I said, I don't care. I'll take it. I will take it. And I went there. And of course, you know, uh, I, having worked in Qatar, you know, with a, uh, another Muslim country, you, you learn that not that I drink, which was, a uh, a, a plus in those countries. It was an, it, it was a, a red flag in the UK. When they said, you don't drink, just something's wrong with you. But anyway, so, you, you know, and bacon too, you know. I love bacon from England, but they didn't have bacon in the Maldives. Anyway, so I take that job, and, and it was just a, just a beautiful place in 1,200 islands. I had my own island, basically. And uh, so it was a place that had no bacon, no no alcohol. And then I get a call. Uh, after, after they stopped paying me, I left after Christmas, and I get this job in Denmark, which is – the totally opposite of the Maldives. It's cold. Maldives was 85 every day. It's dark. Maldives was sunny every day. They have 15 million pigs in Denmark, sausage capital of the world. 5 million people, 15 million pigs. And they drink starting at the age of 14. So it was like the opposite. But I took that job and then I left, uh, when I got the call from IMG and my friend is the director and, and he said, I need a coach right away. And at the time I was really contemplating saying, you know what, my next job I hope is in the States because whether I go back to the G league or where, or even coach high school, I don't care. I'm tired. I'm tired of traveling. And, and lo and behold, bang, I get a call. I need you to come here in two weeks. So I packed my bags and we were having a good season in Denmark and I was really, really close with the players and, and the people there and, such a lovely place, but I had, I wanted to go home and they, you know, um, and I went home and, uh, it was a temporary job. Um, um, and I'm still down here in Florida, but, uh, it, I, it, it's an incredible place as far as facilities and, you know, um, it, it's state of the art of everything. And they have, they have a lot, lots and lots of students and lots of sports, but it gave me an opportunity to come home and now I'm home. And I wouldn't go overseas unless it was a, it was, it was something like Australia or Italy. There's two places that I've always wanted to coach. So those are your dream, dream jobs now. Looking On my forward. bucket list, but I, 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 it would take a lot for me to, to leave the States. I, uh, you know. Is it, was it a longing for us, what well, was Wizards of the Oz, because you brought it up at the beginning? You know, there's no place like home. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think I've seen my share. I mean, there's a lot more to see around the world, maybe when I retire. 
but um, it's it's uh, it's good to be closer to the family. You know, access, it, 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 they they really wanted me to 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 stay home and and not go overseas anymore. And I kept fighting with them, and and I finally I finally realized that they 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 were right. And but I had to do what I had to do, and you know, it's just it's, it'll be a it'll be, it'll be a nice little book that I'm writing about my travels and my my time coaching everywhere and. Um, but I've got a lot of material. Well, I can only imagine because it's, it's like you, that, just that little bit between the difference between, uh, the Maldives and Denmark is like polar opposites and, and not, not a lot of, be it coaches, athletes get to experience one extreme to the other in their, well, yeah, their and entire I went, career. I from, yeah. And I went from Africa to England. So I went from, you know, um, one ethnic race to basically, a, basically, you know, a predominantly white country that spoke, spoke English. So I didn't have to learn the language. It was an easy transition for me. And, but, you know, but I've learned lots of languages, basic stuff, you know, like, you know, shoot, pass, come on, let's go, you know, time out and all that substitution. Uh, but, uh, it, it, the adjustments are, are, you know, I tell coaches that want to coach overseas, you're not, in, you're not in America anymore. You, you have to adjust to their culture. You have to learn, you know, the language. You have to, you have to accept certain things. Things that you are used to are not going to have, especially as a player too. A player, the rules are differently. They, you know, the, the style is different. You know, there's so many other things that you have to adjust to. And these are, uh, these are things that you, you, you know, you, you have to instill in these players that want to go overseas. It's, it's, you just, you just can't go over there with the attitude like, well, I'm, I'm American and I'm better than you. That's that. You'll, you'll be sent home the next, next plane trip. You think those days are long gone then in terms of that mindset and all that mentality? Well, I mean, there are always guys that are going to go over there and, and think that they, you know, that they're better. Uh, I mean, they may be, they may be better, but you have to, you have to respect where you are. You have to respect who's coaching you and who, and the people around you in the community, because if they don't like you and, and feel like you're not um, adhering to their, their culture, then uh, the, you know, and, and they usually are the sensitive. They, they, they like to teach you and show you around and, 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 you know, share, share with you their things that, that they like, you know? So it, it's usually most, most, most places are great like that. They, they, They'll, they'll show you around. And you said languages. Those aren't the basics, John, in terms of re- making it relatable to your sport. That's beyond like the basics of hello, how are you doing? Can right. I have this? Right. You've gone to use it as a, you want to, and I, I can commend you on that because that's probably very different to, 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 to make it specific to, your I use a business term niche in terms of making it specific to basketball and probably the coaches themselves will respect you for it the officials in terms you've gone out out of your way to learn that language to be able to communicate yeah it does help it does help you know um it also helps you know if if they're talking about you and you know you, you know what they're saying you know but I always I always used to get upset when the person can speak English yet they spoke the language because they didn't want you to know what they were saying, you know, like, but, uh, I, I, uh, but it does, it, yeah, it, I mean, the more words, you know, the better, the better you're off. There's no question about it. Uh, it, you know, it does help you blend in, you know, like you said, especially with the basketball specific terminologies and stuff like that. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm here in the states. I, I got a new a new 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 gig, and I'm I'm gonna start in August, and I'm very excited about it. So uh, we're gonna announce it soon, but it's 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 a beautiful place, and um, you know, it's uh, it's 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 a prep school that I'm I'm really excited to go to. And obviously, the the era that you've kind of progressed through with your playing career and your coaching career, how have you adapted to? the modern times of the impact of social media then? Well, it's, that's true. You know, I mean, 
does save you a lot of time. You know, there are some pluses with social media, but there are some dangers too, you know. I mean, uh, back in the old days, we'd have to, if you couldn't talk on a phone, you'd have to get 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 in the car or go so, and, and meet the person, talk to them face to face, which was probably the best thing, you know, because you could see that person and, and who you're talking to. And now you could just send an Instagram message or a, a tweet or, you know, a, a message, a, a messenger, and um, all these other th- different ways of communicating has made it a lot. I wouldn't say easier, but more convenient. Um, I like the face-to-face talks because I want to see who I'm talking to. I want to get, get get an impression. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's um, it does. But again, it has its drawbacks. Like when I was in the NBA, a player that I I I gave an I gave a spot to. We only had ten spots, and I gave this one player who was from the Bronx who I knew, and I cut this other player, and I wasn't playing him. And my friend, now this is the early days of Twitter, and my friend calls me up and says, have you seen Twitter lately? I said, no. He goes, well, someone's taking shots at you and you should see this. And I said, well, send it to me. And sure enough, he was, he was saying stuff that I wasn't playing him and, you know, and, and the NBA finds him. Right. Uh, and I cut him and I took the kid that should have been in that spot and that kid made the NBA. So it was great, great. Does that bring you, you um, ultimate joy then to, 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 for the decision that you made? that person probably took it full heartedly and think, thank you very much. I'm going to now repay you in probably, uh, probably 10 times. Ultimately, they probably don't know that, but it's like, well, I'm the, the faith that you showed in me, I'm going to show my true, true potential. Well, I had promised him. I said, the first spot that's open, I'm going to bring you on board. I'm going to take, I'm going to bring you. And um, he was such a good kid. And when, when the Denver Nuggets called me up and said, Hey, John, tell me what kind of person this kid is. What, you know, how, is he coachable? Is he this? Is he that? Because I have J.R. Smith and I can only handle one of J.R. Smith's. And, and it was like, nah, man, he's never once given me a problem. Never once. And he plays so hard. You, you will love him. And he did. And, you know, I would never endorse a kid, a uh, player if, you know, with my reputation on the line and, and say, yeah, he's a good kid when he wasn't. And then he shows his true colors and they say, Hey John, you know, you said he was, he was a good guy and, and you lied, you know, and we don't trust you anymore. So you can't do that. Do you think obviously that's how you've been brought up in terms of honesty, integrity, transparency? Do you think that's lacking in, in the modern world then a little bit that people are a little bit, I'm, really, I'm trying to use what would be the word not show the true facts in terms of the, the bit, some sort of honesty, but we won't show you everything. Yeah. You know, it's weird with me because I'm a private person yet. I, I am very outgoing and I'm very uh, transparent. Uh, and I think there's a lack of transparency now in, in this culture. I think people do not want to show their hands. Um, and I think to me, if you're honest, I will respect you more than if you withhold something other, you know, for no reason, but to, you know, to keep, keep your, you know, power or something like that, knowledge of that power. Yeah. I, I, I just think there's a lack of transparency and, and, and a fear of, of being exposed, but I tell, I'll tell people straight up, you know, like players that I'm going to recruit, I'm telling them that I'm a new coach. I'm a new coach at this place, you know, uh, this is what I expect. This is this is what you know I'm looking for. This is the type of player I want. Um, you know, if you're that type of player and you want to be pushed and you want to want to develop and get better, and, and you don't mind criticism privately and public praise, then I, I'm your coach. You know, and uh, otherwise, you know, there's plenty of other schools out there that that will you know consider you. But I don't always usually recruit the most talented players. Why? Why is that for you specifically then? Well, I've had my share of winning. I've I've I've, I've won at a, at a few places, and it's great. It's great. I, don't get me wrong. I'm going to continue to try to win, but I think now at my stage, it's more important to help develop the youth basketball and help them 
move on, uh, move up the ladder and get better, and not only get better um, in, in the physical aspect of the game, basketball, but also the mental aspect and, and, and life too. You know, you, you want to teach life lessons. I, I remember one time my, early in my career, one of my players was um, falsely arrested and I had to be a character witness and, and, and the, the solicitor, as you would say, said to me, do you ever talk to your player about anything else but basketball, you know, about other things in life? And, 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 I, and I had to be honest. And I said, no, we haven't really discussed much. And it was that that really opened my eyes saying, you know what? I should be, I should, I should know more about my place without being nosy. And, and it, she put me on the spot and, and I really, uh, it opened my eyes and, 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 and I became a player's coach and, and, and I want my players to realize that I will always be there for them through thick and thin. I've been called three o'clock in the morning, four in the morning to come help, you know, get me out of here, get me out of there. And, and I would, I would, I would never say no. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm going to con- condone any, you know, m- misbehaving either. You break a rule, you break a rule. I've had, a, I've had a, you know, discipline some of my best players. Everybody, it applies to everybody. You think that transition, John, has happened because of that, that for, for mentioned example that you before that it was more black and white as you're a private person. I expect the players to probably be very similar and, and like-minded. So there has to be a divide between basketball and life. And having that obviously situation arise, there needs to be no intangibles. Is that is it's very much there's no alter ego. There's no Batman and Batman and uh, Bruce Wayne. There's no persona in terms of, and this is probably where people don't get me wrong have the, the the essence of putting athletes on a pedestal. It's like, well, we're, we're no different than the average person on the street. It's just we're wired slightly differently in that arena that is our profession, be it basketball, soccer, whatever your sport you play. And we might have a little bit of shortcoming somewhere else, but be it you put them together and make the person kind of be honest with themselves and be transparent as you're John, I'm James. And this is what makes me, me as the individual, the basketball, the education and all that comes in that just, it's like a nice present. And that situation has put, I brought that to the, to the fore with you that there can't be any difference. There need to be conversations outside of basketball, non-related to it. And then obviously when it's time to go, this is what we talk about in practice and especially games. It's focused around the game plan and obviously ultimately winning because that's what sport is about, winning or losing. But I think there's the life lessons as well that you mentioned. I think, you know, you have to instill in the players respect and loyalty and honesty. A lot of coaches say my door is always open, but that's not always true. And I think you have to prove it to the guys. Um, and once you break that barrier and they feel that they can come to you for anything, then your relationship becomes a lot stronger. Um, there is a line that you have to draw between friendship and player coach. Uh, it's not a popularity contest. It's not, hey, you know, you, you're my buddy. Why are you benching me? You know, like that. You can't, you can't because you have to tell them, listen, you're here to play be a member of this team to contribute to the team's success. No individual stuff. It's, it, and it's all about teamwork. And, and I'm constantly instilling that, um, you know, there are some selfishness out there, but you have to break that barrier. You, ha- you have to be the one. You should know better. You should know. Show the kid loyalty. Show the kid tough love. Show him that, you, you know, you're honest and, and you mean what you say. You can't say something one day and then do something different the other day. They don't forget, you know, and, and you have to expect the same in return. Once you instill that in them, and you'll get it in return. And, and then your relationship really, like I said, really becomes stronger and, and they'll do anything for you. So talk about, and obviously for those that didn't listen to our previous episode that we did, because we talked about a lot of your time in the UK on that episode. Talk to me of that time in the UK in terms of 
how you hit the ground running. Uh, obviously, they've had in different seasons probably before and after since you've left, which is probably for a lot of the fan base quite difficult to have a team of our team because I've seen I saw some of the teams that some of the games that you put together, but the, the caliber of athletes and team you were able to assemble, the league were kind of probably at first it's like, well, this is never going to work. This is going to implode. How did you kind of keep all those egos in check based on the facilities uh, kind of being from a small area in the UK versus the big towns that we mentioned in the episode of Newcastle and Leicester? How did you make that co- them coexist and, and buy in to a relatively unknown for most of those players? Yeah, well, it wasn't easy, you know, because we were all kind of first year um, new to, to to the United Kingdom and um, English basketball and uh, British basketball, and I was learning on the fly. And like you said, uh, but I, 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 by, by the end of the year, I I kind of knew how things worked. And but you know, I had a lot of contacts. I still do um, with uh, that, and there was a lot of talent that have that have um, I've been associated with and. You know, I had to convince the players too to come because the salaries weren't astronomical, except for maybe one or two. But uh, the, basically, um, they they came because of my relationship with them, and, and it, it was uh, it wasn't easy. It was a challenge, you know, when you have talent, um, because to get them to buy into the team concept. But we won 26 games, and we were a shot away from making the finals, and and. You know, um, it, it was uh, it was really really. Um, I, I was really excited about the year. I, I, I wish I wish I could have stayed longer, and, and um, I feel like I had unfinished business there. And but I made a lot a lot of friends and relationships, um, and uh, I still follow the league. I follow the team, um, and uh, you know things have changed a little bit. Some haven't. But it was, it was a great, it was great, great experience. And I, you know, the only regrets I have is how, how I handle certain things that came up during the year. But that's, that's, you know, that's, that's how a season goes. It's nothing ever goes smoothly. It is your peaks and valleys and you have ups and downs. And, you know, unfortunately we had, we had some issues we had to deal with, but we fought through it and we, and we persevered. And I think that was a sign of the players because they were much more older and, and mature. We had older guys and, and, uh, so. Um, they helped me out a lot, just as much as I helped them. Well, I think I think people got to see your true character on television as well, Be, um, and people not in the UK can watch some of those uh, games on YouTube. And, and be you give probably your real character over the microphone as well. And then some of those games were quite interesting to to listen. As what was your take on teams that obviously you weren't coaching and kind of. What what's from when you are asked to commentate or analyze a game? What kind of hat, hats do you wear? Because obviously you're going to scout a little bit subconsciously. Yeah, I mean you want to be honest. You want to give the audience knowledge on what's going on from a coach's coaching perspective. Um, you don't want to show favoritism to one or the other teams. You just want to give a neutral. Uh, perspective and uh, I, I enjoyed it you know of course having Dan you know Dan do, do the um, the play-by-play he he was easy to work with and, and I didn't want to you know talk over him or or interrupt him and I, I wanted to let him do his thing and when it was my team time to speak I would but yeah I, I was it was good it was it was a free scouting trip for me and to see two teams and uh, but also share with the with, with the, the British basketball you know fans that uh the way I was viewing the game and, 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 um, I hope, I hope it helped. Uh, uh, if I was funny, I was funny, but you know, that's, that's my natural personality, you know, and, but it, it was very enjoyable and it was something that I, that I, I like doing. Is that something you'd like to venture in after you decide to finally hang up the suit then? People have asked me that, you know, I had a radio show when I was in the NBA Development League. I had my own talk show. Um, 
I did commentating for the NCAA uh, March Madness up for ESPN. But that was radio. You know, I, I don't know. Um, I would consider it. I just, you know, my one of my sisters years ago said I should do it. Um, but, you know, it's it's not for everybody. Uh, I, I would be brutally honest, that's all. You know, I would be brutally honest. If a person made a mistake, I would say, you know, I would, I would call them out on it. So that's, but I, I'm, I'm not finished coaching. You know, my next job, you know, at this prep school is hopefully my last job. And uh, unless something major, major comes up, like an NBA job or something, but I have no plans on going anywhere. I want to settle down somewhere and just coach for the next 10 years or so or longer. You know, it's, it's what I want. Do you, do you think, and it comes back, and we've mentioned honesty quite a lot in the episode, do you think the current climate that we live in can sometimes not be able to deal with you being brutally honest? You know, that's the problem. Um, the problem is some people tell players what they want to hear you know, um, and it doesn't really help them down the road. And you have to, you have to know that if you tell them what they need to hear, they may not like it. I'll give you an example. I, I would always go to my, my oldest, oldest brother, Michael, for advice or if I was in a situation and I needed his help. And I knew he was going to say things that I might not, be comfortable or agree with or like, but I knew he was being honest. So I always listened. And then, and I, and I thought about what he said. Was he right? Most times, most times. Um, but I always listened because I knew I was getting an honest assessment. He wasn't, you know, making things up. He would give me compliments when he had to, but he would also be very, very critical. And and in a, in an educational way, um, constructively, and so that's what I learned to to do. And you have to, but you're right. As the generations go, and and each new one comes in, you have to think things change. Look at how sensitive people are now. Look at how politically correct you have to be. Back in the old days, you can grab a guy by the shirt. Some some coaches smack guys. Well, I mean, Obviously, that, that'd be wrong then and wrong now, but I'm just saying how things have changed. You can't even look at a kid the wrong way. If you don't play a kid, you get in trouble. You know, there's a lot of things now that just have changed, and, uh, you know, either you adjust or you stick to your old ways and, and see if that works. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a new phenomenon, James, you know, and, and parents are a part of it. No, you know, um, they're, they're a part of the phenomenon. I didn't say, I'm not saying they're a bad part of it. I'm just saying that they're a part of it, you know, more, more than ever, more involved, you know, at games, filming, cheering, um, you know, talking to the coaches more. Um, it's, it's just something that, you know, if you're teaching a young coach, they're going to have to learn how to deal with that, that up at this, this new, um, part of the uh, coaching. Do you think it comes down to, you talked about the adaptability there, like pivoting, a little bit using like boxing, uh, dodge and weave, p- quick feet. In terms, of you've got to obviously do like you did with the, in the UK, coach on the fly sometimes, and then obviously preparation is key where you can do your homework ahead of time to obviously keep yourself out of those predicaments. Obviously, um, each to their own in terms of the, whether or not you play somebody. I, I'm probably. I coached the old school way. You earn the minutes that you get right. and it's all to, up to you to gain more. Probably that goes against the popular culture we live in. Whereas people be, I, I talked about even the most recent um, episode about competition and comparison of most people, even my generation. But why is that person starting ahead of me? I'm better than them. Right. So ultimately, and we just, we talked about that's for you as the player to seek you out as the coach 
to become vulnerable, what coach, what do I need to do to get better to get more playing time? And ultimately that takes some guts to do that. It does. It takes integrity. And, you know, a lot of coaches possess integrity. Some, some are just blinded by just winning at all courts, you know, no matter what. And uh, I think the big picture is what lessons are we teaching the, the, these players that it doesn't matter if you're talented or not, you, you know, but we, we, um, the old, old school coach will reward effort. He won't reward talent. Talent is great. Effort is, is to me more important and talent, um, with effort, you've got yourself a really good player and a good team. And you have that when you combine the two, the talent, the team that plays hard for you and, and smart. You know, you're going to win a lot of games, so you won't have to worry about the winning. But the big picture is what lessons are you teaching? If it's say, say it's okay, you're talented, but you're, 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 you don't work hard in practice. You know, it's okay. You know, yeah, to me, that don't work. You're not going to play. You know, if that's the way it is. Now in the NBA, it's different. You know, in the NBA, you have to win. You know, this, uh, it's all about trophies and, and, and championships and stuff like that. And, in college too. I mean, NCA. You know, unfortunately, you get three, four, five year contracts. But if you don't win, your 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 career is cut short. But to me, the ultimate coach is a guy that develops players physically, mentally, gets them to buy into the program, the team concept, and and wins. Also, I mean, it can be done. Yeah. So how do you keep, bring in the right people? So how do you keep people to, to to be to stay hungry? And obviously, I watched an what is an HBO documentary of the women of Troy. Uh, obviously, that's the USC women's program. Of they were they were ruthless, but a lot of them came from inner city uh, LA, Compton, and things like that. How do you get to get every ounce of sweat from that individual, no matter where they come from, be it from the hood? suburbia and you name it how do you get people to get that you get the every ounce of that person first of all i remember when they were filming that i was out there and my friend is the coach at usc jason glover he's he's associate head coach of, of the woman of troy and um what's amazing about women's basketball is it's a lot better than people give credit um, it's really good basketball. And uh, unfortunately, they're not as athletic as men, you know, not as tall and dunk the ball and all that, but it's it's good brand of basketball. In fact, the WNBA is playing at IMG this summer. They use IMG as the, as, as, as the venue. Now, getting to your question, how do you get them to stay hungry? Very simple. I would always get on my players more when we won than when we lost. You know, you, your team is down after a loss. Okay, you let you let the smoke clear. Maybe you have a meeting, talk about some things, but you don't you don't really you don't you don't beat them up. You really stay on top of them when, when they win because how you handle winning is just as important as how you handle losing. And so I would challenge my players. I would challenge my team. The next game is what, and they would all answer me the same answer: the biggest game of the year. The next game is the biggest game of the year. After this game is over, I'd say to them in closing, in the locker room, changing room, when's the next, when's the next biggest game? You know, next, next game. And it's all about communication. You don't just talk to the team, but you talk to the individual, you know, about it. Say, listen, you did this, this, and this last game. This is what you got to do even more. You got to the foul line five times. Get to the foul line seven times. I challenge you. You know, challenge them. Give them goals, short-term goals. Put it on them. Are you pleased with the way you play? A hundred percent? No. Okay. Well, let's see after the next game. You can come back to me and tell me what, how pleased you are when you look in the mirror and say, how was your effort? How did you play defense? Did you rebound? You know? Let's let let's let's re uh, let's revisit 
And so you put these ideas in their heads and you make them think about it. You put it on them and, and say, self-evaluate, you, you, you know, so you, you have to self-evaluate. And uh, so I challenge my players, especially when they're successful, more so, because human nature is you, 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 you drop your guard a little bit when you win, right? You're like, you, you, you're not, you're not thinking about, well, we just lost. We won. You know, I can take it easy. That's human nature. But if you have this mindset where the next game is the biggest game, or I'm going to play better than I did last game, because you can never play 100% uh, satisfactory. You can never give 100% of everything you got. Otherwise, you see people passed out on the floor. Do you see many people passed out on the floor? No, I don't see many people passed out on the floor. So you can't say you gave it a euro. So you try, and you try pushing them that way. It is a lot from the neck up, you know. It's a, it's, it, it's a psychological game you play with them, and, but it's also a, a, a challenge, and, and uh, hopefully they'll buy into it. And, that, in that, and, and the buy-in from that, John, is it irrespective of the levels you've played at? It didn't matter. doesn't matter. Although, the higher level you go, you would think that, you have to motivate them less, but you really, it's not true. And, you know, I think every level is, is, has its similarities and motivation is one of them. Uh, teaching um, and skill work still, still at the highest level. There's guys that, that have not been taught certain things that need to need to improve on basic stuff, fundamentals. You think, you know, NBA guys, okay. Yeah. They, they already did talented. They made the, they made the show. They made the big league. They don't need to work on their game. Well, that's baloney. Everybody, you're constantly teaching. The minute you stop trying to improve, that's when you leave the game, right? As a coach and as a player. So don't think that they don't need work at the highest level because they do. We all know they need it at the lowest level, at the grassroots, and we all know that they need to not only work on their skills, but their, 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 their mindset, their mental aspect their attitude, their habits, you know, getting rid of some of their bad habits, showing up on time, looking at the coach when he's talking to you, you know, paying attention. Oh yeah. But that's, yeah, but that's respect. Ultimately, I, I, I've given you my full attention for, for what are we now over an hour that, that comes back to respect and upbringing a little bit. You know, when someone asks you what's your team rules, and I say basically, well, what it, it revolves around one word, and that's respect. If you have respect for yourself, for your family, for your team, your teammates, the referee, your coach, the game, the community, that one word covers everything. The minute you break that respect is when you break a rule. So respect can go a long way. But is there any punishment or repercussions for breaking one of those rules? You know, if you're going to make rules, you're going to have to enforce them. So you keep it basic. I'm going to treat you like men or women. The minute you don't act like it, then I have to deal with it. Don't put me in that spot to deal with it. I do not want to do that. I don't want to have to, you know, uh, discipline you. But if I have to, I will. And I'll do it the first day of practice. Because if you don't do it the first day of practice and you try to do it the 10th day of practice, say, I've been doing it for nine more other days. How come you didn't say anything? You can't, you can't discipline me now. You let me get away with it. He's right. She's right. So you got to jump on it early. You have to set the example. But if you don't have to, you don't have to. That's great. But there are going to be times when you have to, you know, do something that's, you know, unfavorable or, you know, they, they, they don't agree with. But that's, you're the boss. You're the leader. So my penultimate question to you, John, is if you got to sit down with any athlete, dead or alive, or even coach you know, on that matter, and got to pick their brains, who would that be and why? Okay. The guy cutting the grass outside sounded you out. What, if I could coach anyone? If, if you could sit down with anybody coach or athlete, dead or alive, who would that be and why? Well, 
Well, I would like to sit down with Larry Bird. And it was a point where I would love to sit down with Greg Popovich because I thought he, he's really a, co- a player's coach. And maybe I still would. But he's getting a little too political for my taste. Not that I'm a Trump guy. As you know, I'm not, but I'm I'm not anything. But you know, if you're not anti Trump, then there's something wrong with you. You know, and so I, I don't agree, I don't like to get into politics, but I'd like to pick his brain, you know, uh, basketball wise. There's there there's there, Phil Jackson, you know, um, there's a bunch of guys that I would love to pick their brain and I have I have some NBA coaches that are my mentors, like Bob Hill. He's my mentor, basically. I always tell him what I'm doing, and he's he's honest. He's supportive. He's critical. He's kind of like my brother. My brother the same way, you know. But uh, Bob Hill you know, has been a coach for five NBA teams. You know, he's head coach for five NBA teams, and so I always call him and and try to bounce things off him. And my last question before we wrap up the episode, John, if you have to summarize what we've been speaking about, and I know that's going to be quite difficult in about 70 minutes that we've been speaking, for into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? So can you, can you repeat that? I heard you ha- if you have to summarize in if one you sentence. Have to su- if you have to summarize into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? It's better to be yourself than to be someone else. Be yourself. I don't want to say more sentences, but it's better to be yourself than to be someone than than to try and be someone else. All right. So once again, John, thanks again for coming on the Mindset Athlete Podcast. Thanks, James. I enjoy it. You're you're a, you're a gracious host and and uh, easy easy to talk to. I appreciate that. Oh, it's my pleasure. If you like this episode, please do share it with your friends and do let John and I know what you thought of the episode by tagging us over on Instagram at Coach John Cofino. Coach J O H N C O F F I N O and at James O Roberts 11. And you can do the same on Twitter and Facebook. And in addition, if you had any follow up questions, so I would say to shoot them over as well. And finally, don't forget to check him out on Instagram at Coach John Coffino. And as always, do check out my free content at fitamputee.co.uk and click on the tab Resources. But not forgetting, I've also started a new Facebook group, especially for the show, which you can find by typing The Mindset Athlete over on Facebook. And last but not least... I've also rebranded my other Facebook group to adapt, master and improve your exercise and diet to help you lose 10 pounds plus. So make sure to check those links out. They will be in the description. You can find all the show notes at mindsetgame.lipson.com under the category general. So once again, thanks for listening and I'll catch you next week for another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast.